So this, uh, everyone knows about the five stages of grieving, but what about the six stages of system D? Like many sysadmins, I've looked somewhat askance at the now impending apocalypse of pervasive system D adaptation, and I'd like to walk through my own six stages of that experience. Denial, anger, bargaining, acceptance, and oddly enough, ultimately enthusiasm. quite a lot of people still stuck on this one. <laughs> Who cares about faster boot times anyway? Nothing's wrong with SysV in it. What could possibly go wrong with hundreds of lines of shell scripts with fragile, poorly documented dependencies on one another? And if we get rid of those, it'll be like losing the joys of SendMail file configuration all over again. <laughs> I must admit, I mostly skipped over this stage to anger. <laughs> Lena is literally Satan. And he works for Red Hat, who, if you remember Slashdot from the 90s, are the Microsoft of Linux. So when Microsoft hires Satan to work on Linux, the results are going to be a disaster. Unfortunately, this is the tenor a lot of the discussion still is being conducted at. So at this point, some of us segue into bargaining. In desperation, we move there. I promise I'll use your distro if you stay with using sysv scripts, sysv init. Slez, OpenSUSE, Arch, anyone? Anyone? Unfortunately, the problem is this isn't a great bargaining position because no one is really looking to stay with sysv init except maybe Slackware. If they're not going systemed, they're going to some competing, competing init system. <laughs> then you get a sad. It's all changing. Change is awful, it's scary, it's big. Am I gonna go and have to use, I might have to use a BSD to get away from this. <laughs> it's a fate worse than death. It's a bit of bad news there actually, because the free BSD guys are getting on this kind of next generation init, tra uh, next generation init chain as well, and they've started re revised their efforts to port LaunchD over from, uh, from MacOS. And so I sort of ended up with acceptance. Um, and as part of acceptance, I sort of got a bit grumpy and went, well, you know, work pays me to understand these things, so I'd probably better actually spin it up on some servers and see how well this bloody stupid thing works. And uh, I was kind of surprised, rather against my will, this took me to enthusiasm. This is a great quote by Adam. Anyone who's been in this game for any length of time knows that computers are actually a non-deterministic system. Yes, there are computer scientists who talk about their fancy maths and stuff and how it's all binary and, and clever, but in practice they're not. The PID is there, but the process isn't home. There's nothing so much I personally enjoy as spending five minutes working out whether the complaint about it won't start because there's a lock file means that I'm actually stupidly trying to start up two instances of the same process, or that the old one shat the bed and I'm on laundry duty again. <laughs> and those are just some of the common easy cases we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. And System D helps address those pain points and more, much more. What do I want? I'm not going to do Spice Girls. I want reliability. <laughs> I want a deterministic view of my systems or as close as you're ever going to get. I want to be able to think about and write and enforce policies instead of spending my time telling the computer what to do step by step like a recalcitrant toddler. I want to use the cool stuff that the kernel provides. And I want it to be easy. I want the computer to do the work. Life is too short for boilerplate. So it's way too short to write the same scripts again, which are 80 to 90% identical to one another. I work for a bank, so I have to work with enterprise software, which tends not to come packaged or within its scripts, because heaven only knows when you're paying $50,000 a CPU for something, it's totally unreasonable to expect the vendor to put any effort into customizing it for your platform. 
At the other end of the spectrum, because we have a horde of children doing web development with whatever exciting web framework they just read about on Hacker News this week, we're deploying Rails or Node.js or whatever pops up, and they're not really interested in doing any of the boring, unsexy system, st system, uh, system stuff either. And fundamentally, I'm a pretty lazy person in the Larry Wall sense, and I have better things to do than clone the same damn scripts that barely do anything useful anyway. So I value not wasting my life writing things again and again. So here's a service file to run Ghost, which is a, um, which is a node based blog that some people have gotten excited about. And this is the service file for it, right? So PID1 has got the uh, restart always, so it automatically restarts it if it notices it's crashed, and being a node app, it tends to. Um, and I get that all for free out of system. I don't have to write an init script that then calls run it, which then calls another set of scripts that monitor the node app that do exactly the same job. The config file is easier and briefer, and it gives you more out of the box. And it's also a lot easier to mass manage config files. We have a lot of really good tools to do that. Managing shell scripts, which are programs, is a lot more painful because the tools designed to do that are mostly designed to manage actual applications. This is another example. These were going to be live demos, but I ended up not having enough time. Um, this is, I like to run Postgres as separate databases for separate servers, and I like to run them on the same server instead of having one VM per service. This shows where you can use includes and overrides with, with, um, with the unit files. You source the master one that's installed by your distribution, and then you just override the lines as you care about. So the actual functional difference to stand up a whole parallel Postgres instance for the bare minimum case is about two or three lines of changes, the data dir, the new port, and so on. So. Yeah, yeah, so same binary, multiple data doers, multiple ports. Uh, no, I fill those in manually. But the point is there's a, there's a master Postgres that, shows all the that has all the command implications for the PG control. I don't need to recreate those. That's handled by the include. I don't have to tinker with package scripts or clone them and change them. So that means fewer RPM saves, RPM news scattered around my system every time I do an upgrade. I don't have to diff great big init scripts, I don't have to try and pick out subtle changes part way through them. So my whole life cycle for creating, upgrading, and looking after those services is massively simplified, less time consuming, and a lot less error prone, which is fairly important. There's more than just that. You can see there's some other directives in there as well. Because this is a dev database server that's co-resident with test database server, I've given it a lower block I.O. weight, so I'm passing in CG groups that I want it to run at a lower priority when the system's busy than the test instances, which are more important to me. Because it's a database server, I want it to be very unlikely that if the oom killer comes to town that it whacks it on the head, because relational databases and the oom killer don't get along very well. Um, and I've also just put in a little boilerplate to say that if my valid PG SQL directory is there, don't bother trying to start the service. That's not really so important for Postgres, but I do have applications that have bitten me in the past because they silently start up and look like they're running, but if the directory that they're mounted on isn't there, they recreate all the data. That leads to a lot of confusion for the users about why they can't log into the application anymore, um, and a lot of confusion for me why it's suddenly all changed. Far better for it to fail fast at start time and let me know about that. Computers are supposed to make my life easier, but instead I up work, end up working for them. This is another great Larryism. Easy things should be easy, hard things should be possible. System helps me with this because rather than me talking to it like that recalcitrant toddler, System's got a declarative syntax. I tell it, I tell it the outcome I want, and I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to start rushing. Um, I tell it the outcome I want, and it works out how to get there for me. I am not trying to walk it through the process. And I can trust system to do the right thing in a way I can't trust the ugly menagerie of init, 
INETIT, RC LOCAL, DOUBLE FORKING, PID FILES, LOCK, for, for, lock FILES AND ALL THE REST THAT WE'VE ACCRETED OVER 40 YEARS OF UNIX HISTORY. THERE ARE LAYERS AND LAYERS AND LAYERS OF HACKS TRYING TO GET AROUND THE SAD FACT THAT SYSVNIT BASICALLY HAS NO IDEA WHAT IS GOING ON ONCE IT LAUNCHES A SERVICE. I need service views. In general, I want to think about services, not processes and not servers. I have a Postgres SQL dev service. I have a Node.js service, and so on and so forth. For some things, there's a nice, simple, single process to single service mapping that's easy to manage. But for others, it means a gang of processes working together, and that model can be a pain to track through that traditional view. If you've got a busy Apache server that's got a forking or partly forking model, your process table will look like this, and often that's not the view you actually care about. Once you've got systemd wrapping things up in C groups for you, you get the view that you actually care about, which is what does my Apache service look like? How much memory is my Apache service using? How much CPU is my Apache service using? Rather than trying to intuit how all those processes go there, or write a little script to go through and count up the output of PS. Most tools just expose that bunch of process data, and it's not very helpful. C groups help us solve that problem. System D gets us using C groups with zero effort on our part. C groups have been around for a while, but most people don't make much use of them. I want to manage multi tenant Unix systems, not multi VM hordes like some sort of Windows animal. <laughs> One of the ironies around the criticisms of System D is the idea that it's not very Unix y, because the way we manage Linux these days is we delegate service management out to the VM. People have decided it's too hard in many cases to manage complex multi-tenant setups and stop things stepping all over one another. And a part of the reason for that is that tools like ULimit don't actually give you great control over what happens when things start going pear-shaped. So we go, oh, well, we'll stick them all in individual VMs and the hypervisor will take care of it for us. That's not a very Unix philosophy. Unix is supposed to be a multi-user system. We used to make fun of Windows admins setting up servers everywhere, sprawling all over the place and running one service on each, serv on each server. But we've ended up doing exactly the same thing. System D giving, system D giving us C groups everywhere and making it easy to tune them starts bringing that back in. You can start consolidating, quite possibly on VMs, but you can consolidate multiple services and using the facilities of C groups and the ease of which system D gives you to manipulate them to go back to that traditional Unix multi-tenanted setup. And that's about maximizing reliability and efficiency. We minimize overhead by reducing guest sprawl. Overhead at a system level, but also overhead in terms of your time and energy and how many instances you're running. We degrade our utilization of our platforms when we add unnecessary overhead, and we degrade our utilization of our teams, our number of people. System helps with that through the co-residency. It gives us a lot of easy tuning on other kernel tunables as well, like the Umkill example before. So it's not just about the C groups. I want it to be easy to measure what's going on in my systems. Cost transparency is a big thing where I work, and the traditional Unix tools aren't very good at it, and if you don't agree with that, you have never looked at the ACC tools. Pervasive use of C groups makes it easy for me to gather service level information within instances instead of going back to the rocks banging together of split it all out across VMs or servers. Because that tracking is built into that component, it's pervasive, it's always there. A second criticism um, that's been echoed about systemd is that it's a shift away from a sysfish flavor shared with commercial Unix environments, although not Solaris anymore for the last five years. I have kind of shared that criticism, but I've actually come around on it. That's because Linux the, as a kernel is chock full of great features, but we don't actually really use them in the user land. ACLs, attributes, capabilities, all of them have got kernel implementations, but we very rarely have them exposed to us as sysadmins in a way that's straightforward to make use of. There are probably more Windows users using ACLs and attributes than there are actual native Linux users. 
Linux is becoming a lowest common denominator in the Linux field. Solaris has SMF, FreeBSD will have LaunchD, um, Apple has LaunchD already. Um, we are letting them pass us by with our insistence that we conform to a specs that were largely drawn up 30 years ago. I have more to say, but I think I'm actually out of time. So I will pull up short there and be available for people to yell at later. <laughs> <laughs> question or two while we're setting up the next laptop? Anyone? Anyone? Uh, how does it compare to Upstart? I haven't. <laughs> so that's, 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 that's the other religious war I steered clear of. Um, the two main, so from a personal perspective, the two main things I would call out as differences that lend me in favour of, system, uh, of SystemD one is that, um, you know, I'm following the Debian CTTE discussion at the moment, and it's quite noticeable that in a lot of cases there are promises that Upstart will have some of the functions that SystemD does real soon now. So it seems a little silly to me to use an init system that delivers, say, 75% when you can have one that uses 100%. The other thing that's a really big difference on a day-to-day -day basis for me is SystemD is declarative, and abstracts away a lot of the lower level details, and Upstart doesn't really. You need to understand, you can get corner cases where you need to have quite a deep understanding of how Upstart expects things to initialize, um, and I don't want to do that shit. <laughs>